Amen. So now we are on week three of zeal. And I'm really excited about this part because we're actually going to take what we've learned the past couple of weeks and we're going to now apply it in a way that's actionable, a way that's noticeable. And so if you remember week one, I talked about uh, Romans 12 verse 11, which says, be, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. So week one, we talked about what it means not to be slothful in zeal. Basically what that means is we're not to be apathetic as a church. We are to be active. We're to be involved. We're to be out there preaching the gospel, being Jesus to those in our community. That is so important, right? So we cannot be apathetic. And what Paul is basically directing us to do is to take our misdirected zeal, because as Americans, we have a lot of misdirected zeal. We do. And we need to take that and we need to move it and redirect it to the things of God and his kingdom. That is so important, especially nowadays, as churches are burning in Canada, as Bibles are burning in Oregon, it's time to understand we're in a period of time where our zeal needs to be redirected to the things of God as the church. And we have many in numbers. I see about 200 of you sitting in here right now. We need to come together and we need to redirect that zeal. And if we can do that, then we're going to move things for God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. So that was the first thing. And how do we do that? Well, Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, that if we are raised with Christ, and I believe, hopefully, all of you in here are raised with Christ. If you're not, we're going to take care of that at the end of service. But we need to be raised with Christ. We need to understand what that means. And we need to relive the moment that we met Jesus, that we got saved. That is so important that we do that on a daily basis. And then Paul goes on and says, we need to set our minds on those things that are above. And how do we do that? The word of God is our default setting in our mind. That's how we do that. Because as the world is preaching its gospel to us, we need to make sure that our mind has the filter of God's word. Because if we don't run everything through that filter, then we could fall victim to what the world is preaching. It is so easy to do. Amen? So we need to make sure that happens. And the third part of that is to understand that our life is not our own. Our life belongs to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We have given him our life. And when we know that our life is not our own and that God has our back, then we're going to do some things that we know that God is asking us to do that we know there's no way we can do it in our own strength. It's going to cause us to do things that are outside of our comfort zone. So that is how we are not to be slothful in zeal. And then last week I talked about being fervent in spirit. And I really feel like that God was pressing upon me that what's keeping the church from being fervent in spirit is sin and condemnation. Those are the things that the devil wants to use, right? He tempts us. We follow that temptation as believers. We still do. Don't tell me you don't, because we still do. I know our days get brighter and brighter as we get closer to heaven, but there are still things that we fall down to temptation and we sin. And then on top of that, there's a one-two punch. The devil throws a second punch right across our chin, and it's condemnation. And that condemnation is what keeps us from moving forward. It keeps us from being fervent in spirit. It keeps us from doing the things that God is calling us to do to expand his kingdom. And what I'm trying to do is encourage you that, hey, we're all in this together. You're not alone. Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. And if the gates of heaven are open for me, then how much more are they going to be open for you? So get over yourself. Get over this sin. Make war on that sin. Don't let condemnation push you away and put you in a corner and start doing the job that God has called us to do. So with all that being said, we are now into what Paul says in that final section of Romans 12, verse 11, serve the Lord. So it's an equation, right? If we are not slothful in zeal, if we are fervent in spirit, then we will serve the Lord. That is so important. All right, so let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you so much for the words that you've given me today. Um, We're going to thank you for Chick-fil-A today, believe it or not. Um, But Father, I just thank you that there are some things that you want us to see through your word this morning. You want us to see that you are in business, just like Chick-fil-A, and your business is expansion. Father, I thank you that you're going to help us be part of that business. We already are because we are in Christ. Now it's time for us to put our money where our mouth is. And I ask you that the words that come out of my mouth today, let them penetrate all of our hearts today, Father. Let them be your words 
that drive us to action, and that is to serve you, Father God. We thank you for it. We count it done in Jesus' name. Amen. So yes, Chick-fil-A, which I'm sorry, is closed on Sunday. You my Chick-fil-A. You're my number one with the lemonade. And all the youth over there are cringing right now because I'm quoting Kanye West's song, Close on Sunday. But that's okay. I like, I like that song. Chick-fil-A. So I did some research on Chick-fil-A because how many of us love Chick-fil-A? Wow. If you, if you, if you don't love Chick-fil-A, you're not a believer. <laughs> Get out of this church. No, I'm just kidding. Isn't there, oh my goodness, Brandon, you out of all people. It's pretty bad that I know most of your names, so if you do something, I'm going to call you out. It's the way it is around here. So isn't it something, I mean, you, you, you go to Chick-fil-A, you know, you know you're going to go to Chick-fil-A, and you know what you're going to get, right? You're going to get great food, you're going to get great customer service, and you're going to get a long line through the drive through No matter what time of day it is, it's going to happen. And there's a reason for that. They have a business model that I started to look into because I really believe that being that Chick-fil-A is founded on Christian principles, it is considered a Christian company, kind of like In-N-Out Burger, believe it or not. They are both um, founded and based on Christian principles. Chick-fil-A does business in a way where I feel like it's biblically based. So when I started thinking about serving the Lord, this kind of came to my mind. And I want to share with you some facts and figures about Chick-fil-A. This is from an article in Business Insider Magazine, dated from September 2019. It's about two years old, so I guarantee you these numbers are out of date, but this is what I landed on, and I actually really liked it. So Chick-fil-A's growth has made it the most dominant brand in fast food. The most dominant brand. It is number three in the sense of how much money it brings in. So what's beating out Chick-fil-A right now? McDonald's is number one. Okay? Don't ask me why. They're number one. Number two, and somehow this got snuck into that category, but Starbucks is number two. Number three is Chick-fil-A. So they're the third largest in the United States. They are growing its revenue by 16.7% from the year before. So 2018, 2019, nearly 17% growth with over $10 billion in sales year over year. That's a lot of money right? So their, their goal is to triple their annual sales every three years. That's what they're tracking on doing. Chick-fil-A has managed to stage a takeover of fast food with only a fraction of locations versus McDonald's, Starbucks, all the others that are out there. So what does that mean? That means they have fewer locations, yet they're selling more chicken sandwiches or selling more units or volume of units than any other restaurant that's out there. That's amazing to me. And there's part, of, the part of that is because they're very strategic on where they put their restaurants, which I'm going to get into here in a minute. So with fewer locations, they're selling more volume than their rivals. And they're all about customer service. Am I right? My pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> to the point where you're just like, I'm so sick of hearing that, but, but yet I want more of it. Give me more of my pleasure with some chicken sandwiches and some Chick-fil-A sauce, please, with my lemonade. So their company's growth strategy is biblically sound. It's a strategy that can help us also understand how we are to serve the Lord. Really, it is. But here's the problem. The problem that I see in the church today, and I know I call it all the problems, because look, I I believe God has called me to preach to those situations. I'm I'm not saying that, hey, there's a problem with us per se, is home church. But what I'm saying is there's a theme that I see consistently that I believe God is saying, this is a situation that you need to address. The problem is the church is not really growing right now. See, what we're seeing is more transference than growth. And and I see people, and and listen, if you're from another church and you're visiting today, welcome. And I'm going to say something that maybe a lot of my board members and some others might be like, don't say that. But listen, if God has planted you in another church, he's given you gifts and talents, stay at the church. Well, they don't have this that I want, or they don't have that that I want, or I'm looking for this and they don't have it. But are they preaching Jesus is the only way. 
stay at that church. Take the gifts and talents that God has given you and use them in that church. There's a reason why you're there to begin with. Now, if you're looking because you just moved here or whatever, then fine. I want you, I, I, listen, whether you're looking and you're, you're here and you now you know you want to be here, then please stay here, okay? But God is going to use your gifts and talents wherever it is that he plants you. I've seen too many people leave this church, go to other churches that had incredible gifts and talents that are no longer here, and they're just kind of bouncing around looking for places to go. And that is completely counterproductive. So the church is just being spread out and moving around, and we're not really just remain planted and growing where I think God is wanting us to be. And right now what he's saying is it's time to grow. And how are we going to grow? We're going to grow by serving the Lord, and we're going to apply Chick-fil-A principles. Here's another thing, is that the growth that we're going to see, and I think part of the reason why people are like, well, this church ain't doing what I want, so I'm going to go over here, is because they're used to the old way of things being done. And God is changing those things up. And, and one of the analogies I like to use is, 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 is a pool of stagnant water. So how do you change that, that pool of stagnant water? You put fresh water in it. You, you stir it up. You, you, you add oxygen to it, new life to it. The, the church is needing that right now. And I believe God is moving. I think the pandemic has kind of started that move and we're seeing this new move of God that we haven't seen before where now we're seeing a lot of people join online. We're seeing a lot of people coming into the buildings now because you know what? The pandemic's really freaked them out. They're unemployed. Their marriage is in trouble because they've been cooped up with somebody for over a year in the same house. It's like they're looking. I know we can say that for some of us in here too, right? But they're, they're looking for answers, and so God is getting ready to do something. He's already doing something. Now we just need to get on board that train. And so it's not going to look the same as you know as it's been in the past. And I can remember our past as a church. When we used to be Grace Church, we're now Home Church. Things were done a whole lot differently back then. And when we decided to make some changes, we felt like God was leading us to do. Man, people were scattered like we were the plague. But you guys are still here and we have new people here. And I'm so glad that you're here because we've got things to do. And they're going to look completely different than the way we used to do them. Hence the reason why I believe God wants us to seek the welfare of the city. That's one of the, one of the principles of what we're going to be doing as a church. Amen. There's a reason for that. Hua, yes, thank you, Brandon. So, so what is God all about? How do we serve the Lord? The first verse I want to get into this morning is Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. And this is Paul thanking God for the people of the church at Colossa. He says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. And so here we are, early church is really sprouting wings and flying, man. It's growing like crazy, right? It's bearing fruit and increasing. That's what God wants from us, the church. Are we producing? Are we expanding? Are our numbers of believers growing? Or are we stagnant? That's the question. And if you bring it down and funnel it down to us individually, what are we doing to grow and expand God's kingdom? Are we doing enough? Are we doing anything at all? Hence the reason why we've talked about being zealous and how we are to be fervent in spirit and how we are not to allow things to hold us back, even our own lives, even our own sin and the condemnation that follows. We cannot allow that to hold us back. We have got to get out of this stagnant stage that we're in, and we've got to reproduce for God's kingdom as a church and as individuals. Because not only are you called to a church, those of you that are in here, I believe you're called to be here, those of you that are visiting, you found a place. This is your home. Okay? Not only are we call as a church to grow the kingdom here as the church, but we're also called in our own workspaces, in our schools, out in public when we go about and do the American thing and buy things we don't need. We are to reproduce. We are to grow the kingdom. That is so important. And Paul thanks God for this church because 
he is seeing from them that they are being fruitful and they are increasing. God is in the business of expansion. That is the great commission. We are to make disciples of all those in the world, right? He is in the business of expansion. So how do we do that? I'm glad you asked. (laughs) Turn to Luke chapter 19. This is a parable that Jesus told his disciples called the parable of the ten minas. A mina is basically a unit of measurement that is worth about three months' wages. So it's a lot. But we're going to talk about the parable of the ten minas. And as we read through this parable, what you're going to see is, is Jesus, he often spoke in parables. And this really is a reflection of him. He's the one that's the nobleman that's going to be mentioned here. He's the one that's the ruler that's going to go away. He's going to leave his servants in charge, do, the, do his work, and then he's going to come back. And man, you don't want to be on the side of that servant that doesn't produce, and you don't want to be on the side that's not a believer because you're going to get... Okay? So this is a, a parable that's analogous to him. So if you go, th- go through that, keep that in mind. So let's begin in verse 11. And he says, as they heard heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So the people, the disciples heard these things and and I'm going to get into that here in a minute. But they all thought because he was on his way to Jerusalem to be crucified and resurrected, they all thought that his kingdom was coming now. And he's basically going to correct them and say, nope, it's not coming right now because there's work that needs to be done. So as they're thinking that, he decides to go into this parable. We continue in verse 12. He said, therefore, a nobleman, he's referring to himself, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling 10 of his servants, he gave them 10 minas. And said to them, what does it say? Read this with me. Engage in business until I come. Okay, when I read this, that just rose up in me. God is about business. Engage in business until I come. Has he come back yet? So we might as well throw the open sign up on the front door of this church, right? We are open for business. And I know some of you are like, ugh, you know, church is not a business. Uh, it's God's business. God is in the people business. And so are we. We're all about customer service. Because hopefully the customers that are coming in here have yet to be served. And we're going to serve them the gospel. So the very first point is we as the church, we need to engage in God's business. We are to make disciples, and this requires something very key and something that's probably some of you who are introverts is going to make you uncomfortable. It's called relationships. It's... <laughs> who said that? <laughs> Cheryl, I know your name. Relationships. That means actually being with people and talking to them and getting down in their dirt and being part of their lives. Yay! It's so hard to do because I have work and I have family and I got kids' activities and I got my own things I like to do and things on Netflix that I like to watch and oh my gosh, all these things, right? So it's like it's hard to stay on task, but God is saying the business part that I want you to be concerned with right now is relationships. It all starts there and Chick fil A recognizes that. Chick fil A has, has been quoted on saying this, and, and I've got the guy's name, and I'll, I'll mention it here in a minute, but we, we are not worried about transactions. In other words, units of chicken sandwiches or chicken nuggets that are like crack. I, I, they don't, they, of course, they care about how many of those things they sell because they're in the business of selling chicken, right? They have, they have to make that, that obligation to their shareholders, and they sell more chicken, But he says, we're not really into the transactions per se. We're into the building of relationships. 
because they realize if they build relationships, they're going to build a lot more transactions of those chicken sandwiches flying out of the drive through window, okay? So the relationship aspect is so important. And they do so by building relationships with potential customers, not people that are already loyal to Chick-fil-A. So that means all of us. Not that they don't care about us. Of course they do. My pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. Yes, refill on my lemonade. Yes, my pleasure. It's yes, they care about us, but they're basing their business model off of potential customers. That's the people that are out there that are not saved. Those are the people out there that need Jesus right now. We need to build our business on potential customers, right? So who is it that they're going after? Just so you know, these are interesting facts. They're going after college football fans and their families. They somehow have figured out that that's their niche. That's what they're going to focus on. So what they're saying is, it's not really about chicken sandwiches. It's about building relationships with those that are not yet customers. So for us, salvations are a given, right? Yes, we want people to get saved and know Jesus. Yes, we want people filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, we want people to be discipled. Yes, we want them also to be zealous, to be fervent in spirit, and serve the Lord. That's great, and that's the end goal, but it requires us to also go after and build relationships with those people that are yet to be all those things. And that is so important. And that's why I believe God has given me in this church the vision to seek the welfare of this community. So how do you do that? You want to know something? And I see this in my own life. If I'm completely honest with you, when Lisa and I go to Target, can I say that? We go to Target? Why not? We go to Target. We love Target. If you don't have the red card, you got to get the red card. It's great. Save 5%. So I loved, yeah, I know, it's, it's, yeah, it's a blessing and a curse, right? I, we love Target. We go to Target, and it's like we go in there, and I'll be honest with you, we put blinders on. We just want to get in and out. And it's amazing how many people come up to me and say, hey, aren't you Pastor Jeff? Oh, yes, 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 thank you. It's like I just want to get in and get out. And I think that's how we live our lives sometimes as Americans, right? We're, we're interested about our lives. We're, we're kind of, we're, our lives are our are the most important thing, obviously, and we, we go out there and we try to do things without being noticed, and we just want to get in and out, and especially Cheryl, right? Cheryl, you just want to do business, get in and out, and not have contact with people. <laughs> See, you shouldn't have said that. Now I'm going to be picking on you. But what I, I know, I know, you know, I, you know my heart, but it's like we've got to take those blinders off, and we simply have to be nice to people, that, I was like, Lord, how do, we, how do we start this relationship thing with people that are outside the church, people we don't know, people that are strangers, people that, you know, when it comes to me on my one-on-one responsibility with folks that I encounter, how do we do that? He's like, just be nice to people. That's what Jesus did. He was just compassionate and nice to people. Can we do that? And, and I feel like, the, you know, the devil's like, nope, you can't because I'm going to throw a mask on your face and, and I'm going to make you afraid to go out. It's like, no, 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 no. We got to get, we gotta get past this. There's no more barrier, barrier between you and I. There's no more, I mean, here in Oklahoma, no more is a mass anymore. There's no more barrier. Let's get rid of that and let's start engaging people again. But we've been trained over the past year to separate ourselves from the public. And we got to get back into it. The church especially, we are to be light and darkness. Amen? So you guys got me on a tangent. I'm already running behind. Gosh. So Luke chapter 19, verse 14 through 15, Jesus goes on, but his citizens hated him, that's the nobleman, that's Jesus, and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned, having received the kingdom, he ordered these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know what they had gained by doing business. What's going on here is basically Jesus is referring through a parable that the citizens that hated him were the Jewish people that rejected him, the Pharisees, right? But also can, can also be applied to today, those of us 
that have said no to him and no to the gospel, the people that have said no to him and no to the gospel, that also fit into this category. But what he's saying here as he's calling to servants that he has given them money and wanted to see how they've done business is the second point is God expects, expects exponential growth. What are you going to do with the gift that our ruler Jesus has given you? How have you grown the kingdom? Through the investment that God has made in you. Because after all, if you've received Jesus and you are saved, you have been chosen. He's given you that investment. He's placed Jesus inside of you. He's placed the spirit of his living self inside of you. He's invested in you. What have you done with it? It's like that Janet Jackson sign that keeps plaguing me recently. I don't know why. What have you done for me lately? There's people here, the young, the young people over there are like, what is that? Go listen to it. It's a great song. It's real catchy. But I, it's like God is saying, what have you done for me lately? Exponential growth. Multiplication. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to get Old Testament now. Because I started thinking about growth and how God is in the business of growth and how as we serve the Lord, we need to also be in that same business. He reminded me of this. So, God is speaking to Adam and Eve. And in verse 22, he says this, God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply in the earth. Turn to Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. He said this to Noah, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and and fill the earth. And my goodness, it almost felt like we were going to be Noah again last night when that rain was coming down. (laughs) Genesis chapter 22, beginning in verse 17. And God said this to Abraham. He says, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on seashore and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice leviticus chapter 26 verse 9 god said this to moses he said i will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and will confirm my covenant with you there is all of this be fruitful multiply, be fruitful, and multiply. We are supposed to be fruitful and multiply. That is how we serve the Lord. So how do we do that? Well, let's go back to Luke chapter 19. Now we're going back to the New Testament. Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 5. Beginning in verse 5. So if you remember when I started reading in Luke chapter 19, I talked about how after all these things, Jesus told them a parable, right? So what are all these things? Well, here it is, beginning in verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And I have defrauded anyone of anything. I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said on him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus showing us right then and there that we are to invest in relationships. The fact that he was willing to go to Zacchaeus' house and spend time with him caused Zacchaeus to repent turn away from his sin, actually restore fourfold the things that he's stolen from those people. And Jesus said, truly, salvation has come to this house. See, when we invest in relationships and we do it in a meaningful way, we do it from the heart and we really mean it and we really love people, then that's going to turn them around from their sin and have them choose Jesus and repent. For it's the goodness of God that leads to what? Repentance. So how is God going to show his goodness to people? A lot of the times he shows his goodness through us as we love people. So Chick-fil-A thinks the same thing. 
And you know what they did? They took their chicken sandwiches into college football locker rooms. So they fed all the athletes free Chick-fil-A. And what happened is because of that, because of them spending the money and the resources, they gain stadium contracts. So now they're not just feeding the athletes, now they are selling their product to 50 to 60,000 people in a stadium every Saturday at college football games. And what they said is that it cost them. So their vice president of sales, his name is Steve Robinson, said this, yes, it's an expense and not always an easy one for everyone to grasp, but for us, measured in terms of relationships built and enjoyment for our fans and our customers, it's worth it. In other words, serving people, loving people, investing in them, it's going to cost us. It's going to cost them your comfort. It's going to cost them your time. It's going to cost them your money. It's going to cost you as you serve the Lord. Okay, last point. Luke chapter 19, verse 20. So then another, another came saying, Lord, here is your mind in which I kept laid away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you, because you are a severe man. You take what you did not deposit and reap what you did not sow. So he said to him, I will condemn you with your own words, you wicked servant. You knew that I was a severe man, taking what I did not deposit and reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank? And at my coming, I might have collected it with interest. Verse 24, and he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has 10 minas. And they said to him, Lord, he has 10 minas. I tell you that everyone who has more will be given, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. We will be held accountable. That's the third thing you need to understand. God has invested in you, as I said before. We are now going to be held accountable. The reason why is because we're capable. There's no excuse But see, what kept this servant, this wicked servant, from doing what God has commanded was he really wasn't on board to begin with. He didn't have the master's heart. And that's what we need to examine. Do you truly have the heart of Jesus inside of you? Because if you do, then you're going to take your mina and you're going to invest it. You're going to serve God. And what he's saying here is, you need to have my heart, And now you need to do something about it. And I think what's happened is, like I said last week, is that sin, condemnation keeps us from moving forward. We're afraid. We're afraid because of our own insecurity of the things that we know about ourselves. We're afraid because we don't know how people are going to respond as churches are burning and Bibles are burning in this continent. It's like we got to get over the fear. There's no excuse. We have been invested in and we have the Spirit of God living inside of us. So we will be held accountable. And here's the reason why. Luke chapter 19, verse 27. So Jesus goes on. But as for these enemies of mine, these are people that did not accept him, who did not want me to reign over them, Bring them here and slaughter them before me. That's the reason why we do this. That's the reason why we serve the Lord. Because there's going to become a day of reckoning. We're going to see those people that have not received Jesus be thrown into this pit. Weeping and gnashing of teeth and pain and suffering for all eternity. It's called hell. We're going to see that day come. We're going to be witnesses of that. That's the reason why we got to put ourselves out there. That's the reason why we need to serve the Lord. So in conclusion, with all this being said, a reminder of what Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. With everything that I have said today, What I want you to take away is simply this. If you serve the Lord, then you will have a zealous and fervent spirit. It's this cycle. I wish I had a graphic for you, and I don't. I didn't give it 
to Mallory, but I had it in my head. And it's like, this verse is like a circle. It's, it, it's, it's very symbi- symbiotic. It's very continuous. It's, yes, I need to have a, 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 um, not, a slothful, uh, not slothful zeal. Yes, I need to be fervent in spirit. And yes, I need to, in order to serve the Lord. But see, if you just start with, hey, you know what? I'm just going to start serving the Lord. Whether I have zeal or not, I'm going to start serving the Lord. And, and what's going to happen is it's going to create zeal. Fervency in spirit. It's just going to be this continuous cycle. And that's how I believe Jesus made it through all the stuff that he went through to get to the point where he's now resurrected and seated at the right hand of the Father. is because he just put action to his words. And as he continued to serve people and have compassion on them and get down on the dirt with them and, and just heal them and be with them, then it just continued to feed that zeal and that fervency. Andy Stanley, pastor of North Point Church in in Atlanta, Georgia. Some of you might have heard who Andy Stanley is. He's written a lot of books. He actually encourages unbelievers in his church to serve. Because he believes that if you serve with God's people, those of us that are saved, if you serve with them and you see what God does through them, and what God does through you, even though you may not be a believer, then all of a sudden, you're going to become a believer. There's going to be fruit to that. So if you're sitting in here and you're like, you know, God can't use me. Well, if you're a believer, he can definitely use you. And if you're an unbeliever, he can still use you, and he will. So, my wife and I, we went to Bentonville, Arkansas over the weekend or I should say Wednesday through Saturday, we took some time off. And even though we typically like to go to places that we can't go out to eat, um, they don't, we don't have around here, guess where we went one day? Chick-fil-A. And guess what? The line for the drive through is just as long as that one on a memorial in Bixby where the line literally spills out on Memorial Drive, which is extremely dangerous, by the way. But it's the same every Chick-fil-A you go to. And the weird thing is, I'm going through, and they're being super nice to me, and, 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 and taking my order. McDonald's is on the other side of that. There's nobody in line in McDonald's. Nobody. It was 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We had a late lunch, and the line was out, out the back and onto the street. So there was this one young lady who helped me at the end and gave, brought me my food, and she started talking to me. It was just being really nice. Really nice. Like, oh, your name is spelled with a G. That's awesome. So when she said, after I said thank you and I took the food, she said, my pleasure. I knew she meant it. There was that genuine, I could tell that she really cared. And that's what God wants from us. That we really care. So when we serve people and we say in our, in our hearts, my pleasure, they, they, they feel that, they sense that. That's the reason why we're getting so involved with the community of Broken Arrow right now. I want them to see our hearts. I want them to see that we care about them first like Chick-fil-A does, before we care about whether or not they buy our product. In our case, we care about them first so that one day they may receive the free gift of Jesus. That's why we're picking up trash. That's why we're helping boost our mothers. That's why we're letting them use our parking lot. That's why I believe God has given us the vision to seek the welfare of this city. So, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord.